So, after about six years of marriage, my wife and I moved back to this area, and we started a church over in Oriel Beach Elementary School called New Life Christian Fellowship. It was uh, a very interesting time in our life, and I told Lynn as we had found out about Calvary Chapels, I, I never really knew anything about Calvary Chapels till 1983. I went to an Assembly of God uh, Bible College where I met Lynn, and then to a Baptist seminary in Kansas City, Missouri, and then came back to my hometown and was invited to check out Calvary Chapels in San Diego, California. So I flew out there and met a pastor named Ray Bentley who became a lifelong friend of mine. And he said, uh, John, you should just go back to your hometown, uh, rent some place, and start teaching the Bible. And I was kind of like, really? That's it? He goes, yeah, just do that. So I told Lynn, we'll do that for a year, and we'll see what the Lord does. And so we started, and uh, it's been 40 years, and we... Uh, after two years, we moved out of the school, built our very first building over there where the family room is, and the Lord just kept adding to the church daily as uh, people would get saved, and he just uh, has given us the privilege of serving in this community now for 40 years, raising our kids here in the church, and now all three of our children live here in Gulf Breeze. We've uh, got 14 grandkids, and uh, all I can say is this, is God is very faithful. Amen? Amen? Well, let's pray together, and then we'll get into our, our message today. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the privilege of, of serving you. Thank you for the privilege of being a part of the fellowship here that you've raised up, and all the things that we've seen you do over 40 years, lives and marriages and Lord, just the way you've, you've worked and powerfully in people's hearts and lives, churches that have been planted, uh, missionaries who've gone out, and all the different teams that have served around the world, we're grateful. So, Lord, bless our time today. Continue to speak, continue to lead, continue to guide. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, we're stepping out of Mark today, and I would ask you to go with me to Matthew chapter 10, we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to follow Jesus. And I want to start with a true story that happened in this area. And it starts like this. Her name is Mary. She was seven years old, and she had been missing from her family for six weeks. She lived in Molino, Florida, only about 28, 30 miles from here. For six weeks, the family prayed, they hoped, and they waited. And then Mary was found in Indianapolis, Indiana, over 700 miles away, living in a shelter for the homeless, with the homeless. Her identity was discovered. They called home to her family. And this female basset hound who had been missing for six weeks was returned to her family and her owner. But, but here's the story. Here's how it went down. Interesting story. This dog drifting down Highway 29 was picked up by a tourist and ends up in India, Indiana, Indianapolis. So once they discover the identity, they call the owner, and the owner says, I, I would love to have my dog back, but there's no way that I can afford to drive all the way up to Indiana to pick Mary up. Mary might as well be in Mars. So they put the story on a local TV station there in Indianapolis. They talked about Mary, her owner, how they got separated. They showed a picture of this cute little basset hound. And can anyone or would anyone like to help? Well, people responded. And then this one guy called and says, my name is Jim Irsay. I own the Indianapolis Colts football team. 
And he said, I'm going to be flying my private jet to New Orleans tomorrow. I'll be there for a few days, and I would be glad to take Mary back home. So he does. So Mary comes home on a private jet <laughs> with a famous Indianapolis football star eating a steak from St. Elmo's, a very famous restaurant there in Indianapolis, with a Indianapolis Colts t-shirt on. <laughs> and I say all that to say this, if God can do that for a basset hound, what can he do for you and I? Amazing story. Our text today is in Matthew chapter 10, and it's being told by Matthew. You probably know Matthew's story. He's a disciple, a follower of Jesus, but prior to that, he's a tax collector for the Romans, even though he's Jewish. He's disowned by his own family. Matthew's not allowed to attend synagogue. He's a traitor. He's an outcast, not just from his family, but from his own people. And now as he pins this gospel, he's a follower of Jesus Christ, one of the 12. He belongs. He's chosen. He's part of a team, a team with purpose and significance. And I would submit to you, it's so important to belong, to belong to God's family, to, to have purpose and direction and, and, and know that, that God has called you to himself. And, and that's why he birthed the church, that we might have a place where we belong, that we have purpose, that together we can feel at home. I think for the first time in his life, Matthew probably felt like he was finally home. Been away from his faith, left his roots, his people, working for the hated Romans. I mean, it would be like a Jew serving Hamas today. He, he, had, he was with these, these people who had subjugated his people. And now he's involved with an amazing call on his life. No longer working for the Romans, but now working for the Messiah of Israel. In fact, the Savior of all humanity. This tax collector who worked with figures and numbers and uh, recording payments now takes a quill, so to speak, and he's recording something entirely different than money. He's recording the life of Jesus Christ. He talks about his virgin birth and his heritage. He, he talks about the, the, the life and ministry of his miracles and his teachings. And, and he sits down and records all that he's heard and all that he's seen. He, he talks about the horrible crucifixion and how everyone deserted him. And, and then the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 10 of Matthew, he records and, and tells about some of the things that God called them to do through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus pulls his men together, the men who would lead and, and birth the church. They're on the day of Pentecost in the, the book of Acts, gathered with another group of people, about 120. They're waiting, and the Holy Spirit comes, and, and God saves 3,000 that day. Jesus had a time with them, but it was very brief, only about three and a half years. And he trained them, he discipled them, he sent them. And Matthew and Peter and James and John and Andrew, the whole crew, the 12 of them. Well, that was Jesus' plan. Just those guys. There was no backup plan. There was no plan B. Hey, if these guys don't work out, what am I going to do? You guys were it. And please listen, God has a very specific plan. He sent his only son to die on the cross for your sins, for my sins. And it's up to those who know him. It's up to those who follow him to tell others about him. See, James and John and Peter and Matthew and Andrew and the whole crew, they're grown now. They're, they're finished. And here's the deal. Now that call is in your hands, in my hands. 
You are telling people about Jesus, aren't you? I mean, that's why he left us here. That's our call. That's our mission. And, and, and that's his plan. For you and I, it's our roots. He calls us to himself for a purpose, to be a part of a community, but, but also to tell others about this great salvation that's available through Jesus Christ. See, in the very last verses of chapter 9 of Matthew, before we get into 10, it, it, it has some very interesting things that Matthew recorded. It says in verse 36, when he saw the multitudes, Jesus, Matthew 9, verse 36, he was moved with compassion because they were weary and they were scattered. They're like sheep having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers willing to go out, they're few. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Jesus saw the people. It says they were weary. The actual meaning of that word in the Greek means stressed and troubled. Now, I would submit to you that we live in one of the most stressed out times in our culture and our history than ever before. The amount of anxiety disorders that are going on in our culture with young and old the amount of people who are on some kind of medication for anxiety and stress, it's off the charts. Related issues like social media, uncertain future, racial and political differences that are, that are just so stressful today. I don't know if you saw, even yesterday in D.C., that, that, that march of thousands or more people calling for a ceasefire in Israel and the stress that that's creating politically and with, with friends and relatives, the, the gender confusion that's going on in our culture, the wars, the mass shootings, the murders, the global warming, who's figuring that out, the, the fentanyl explosion where people are dying and the woke churches and the schools and the distrust of leaders and on and on and on we could go. That we live in a time where I think Jesus looks around and he sees people that are weary, anxious, uptight. There's a, there's a great verse, though, that I, I want to read to you because I think the things that we're seeing in our culture today and in our country today have a lot to do with what the Bible describes as birth pains that are getting closer and closer and closer together as we're approaching the second coming of Jesus Christ. You know, I believe that Jesus Christ came and I believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. And I think he's coming sooner than we think. As we look at Russia and China becoming buddies, where we've got this whole thing going on with Iran, we've got a full-fledged war happening in Israel right now with Hamas and Hezbollah to the north. And, and as you read the scriptures, the prophetic things that are going in there, there's words of, a, of encouragement in the scripture. There's words that you and I need, need to hear from the Lord and respond to the Lord. Let me just read one of them to you. For this we say, and this is the Apostle Paul, to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep or who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, who's identified in Scripture as, as Michael, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. In the midst of a crazy culture, 
We can comfort each other with the words that Jesus Christ is coming back and he's calling those to himself that has received him as Savior and Lord. Amen? Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus, right? Yeah. Amen. So, so now as we, we, we know that we live in this time where people are weary, he goes on and says not only that, but they're scattered. They feel cast off. They, they feel tossed aside or insignificant with, without purpose is how I would describe it. With, without real sense of meaningful direction. In, in fact, it goes on to say that they're like sheep without a shepherd. They have no one to guide them, no, no one to lead them. You know, David said in Psalm 23, a psalm that everyone knows at least part of it, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. And I would submit to you that everyone needs a shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want or I have everything I need. And listen, if, if you're one of those people who are never satisfied in life, I'm not satisfied with my house. I'm not satisfied with my car. I'm not satisfied with my spouse. I'm not satisfied with my life. Then most likely, the Lord's not your shepherd. David penned it this way. The Lord is my shepherd. I've got everything I need. He leads me. He guides me. He supplies for me. These were like sheep without a shepherd. And so, so Jesus is saying, hey, guys, the harvest... Because our culture is like this, because the situation is, is, is calling out to us, pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. And then this is what happens next in chapter 10. He called his 12 disciples to him. And he gave them power over spirits to cast them out, to heal. And, and, and the, the name of the 12 apostles are these. And he names them off, all of them. But what's interesting, if you look at chapter 10, verse 1, he calls them disciples. Verse 2, he calls them apostles. See, there's a, a transition happening right at this time in Matthew chapter 10. They're called disciples, then they're called apostles. Disciple is one who learns under a master teacher. An apostle is a qualified, trained representative sent out on a mission. So they've been with Jesus. They, they've been disciples. They've been learning. They, they've, been, they've been training. And now Jesus says, okay, now it's time to send you out. And transitions can be scary, can't they? Transition from one thing to another sometimes is, is very uneasy, very, very scary. If you're, if you're a parent... Well, first of all, the transition from not being a parent to being a parent is not only scary, it never goes away. But I'll never forget when our kids were young, we put them in a Christian school over in Pensacola and we were living in Holly-by-the-Sea. And every morning, Monday through Friday, I would pack the kids up in the car and I would drive them over the Garson Bridge all the way up into North Pensacola and drop them off at school. I did this for several years till finally my son Neil, who was just up here a minute ago, got his driver's license. And I transitioned that role from me to a train representative <laughs> of our family. And I sent him out. Now, I must say, I sent him out with much fear and trepidation. Because he had with him the most precious things in my life and in the life of my wife, Lynn. He had himself, he had our daughter, Jenny, and he had Ryan all in the car. And, and I can remember that first day that we, we said, okay, Neil, you got your license. Uh, now it's your time to drive the family to school. So we fasted, we prayed, we, oh Lord, and, and um, we transitioned him. And, and Jesus is doing this here, he's transitioning his men. And when you, when you look at the ministry and the stages, you know, in this, this, of, of these men that Jesus chose, 
as you read the Gospels, there, there are stages in our life and in their life as a disciple and as a person who reaches maturity, so to speak. First of all, he calls you to himself. He, he knocks on the door of your heart, the Bible says. He says, hey, if you'll open up that door, I'll come in. And, and I remember this happened to me when I was 18. I, it was, I know the month, it was the month of December. I turned 19 uh, two months later in February. And, and God began to knock on the door of my heart. And at first I was like, gosh, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know if I can live it. I don't know if I can do it. I was a high school dropout. I, I was involved in things that I shouldn't have been involved in. It was, it was the 60s, 70s. I was using drugs. Uh, uh, back then, marijuana used to be illegal. I was involved in that. And there was this other thing that I used a little bit, which I promised myself I never would. It was called LSD or something like that. I think that was illegal too. But God was knocking. He was calling. And I remember giving my heart to the Lord, and man, everything changed. God began to open up life to me. I, I, I was a high school dropout. I was traveling with my older brother who was a pro surfer. And, 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 and I, I, I would, man, I'd just go to church whenever I could, any concert I could go to, any Bible study. And, and God opened a door after I finished high school to go to Bible college. So I went off to Bible college and got teaching and instruction, was getting discipled because I didn't know anything about the Bible. And then I went off to seminary, to, to Kansas City, Missouri. I don't know if you've ever been to Missouri. It snows a lot in Missouri. I grew up in Florida. And I remember when I graduated from seminary and my wife finished college there, we were getting ready to leave, and I said, Lynn, look in the rearview mirror, because you're never going to see this place again. <laughs> and we never have been back to Missouri. <laughs> I went to St. Louis. I'll take that back. I went to St. Louis once. But the Lord sends and empowers his disciples to share, to harvest, to disciple, and be a faithful representative of Jesus. The, the first stages with Jesus and his men are very interesting if you read the Gospels. When you look at the ministry in the early stages, Jesus and his men, Jesus is teaching, Jesus is doing all the healing, Jesus is doing all the miracles, Jesus is doing all the leading. And the disciples were, were somewhat, most of the time, confused. Well, one time they had a huge crowd there and Jesus was teaching them and it got late and, and the disciples said this, Lord, just send them away. Let them fend for themselves. She said, what? These guys have been here all, they're hungry. Let's feed them. And they just wanted to walk away from them. One time they, they, they bumped into some Samaritans and they were kind of had this, this racial thing with the Samaritans. They were half Jew. They had integrated and, and they wanted to call fire down from heaven on the Samaritans. And these are Jesus' disciples. Lord, let's just toast these guys. And Jesus like, what kind of spirit are you guys of? Most of the time that Jesus would catch them arguing about who was the most important among themselves. And I, and I always ask myself, most important at what? They weren't doing anything at this time. They were going to get food sometimes, freaking out in storms, had difficulty understanding messages. And it, it, it's, it's crazy. In, in Mark chapter 3, as we've been studying through the gospel of Mark, there's an interesting passage that, that, that I want to read to you that, that I think has a lot to do with just following Jesus. Listen, listen to this. In Mark chapter 3, it talks about when Jesus called his men to himself. And it says, he went up on a mountain and he called to him those he, he wanted. And they came. He pointed at the 12. And here's what he said. Matthew records this that they might be with him and that he might send them out. See, in the beginning, and this is part of that transition thing, they were just disciples, and Jesus says, I want you to just be 
with me. And at the beginning of your, your walk with Jesus, it's kind of, that's what it is. You're not a great theologian when you first come to the Lord. He just wants you to learn of him, to be with him, to spend time with him, to, to, to hang out with him. And, and you know, you, you, spending time with Jesus. Oh, yeah, you can go to Bible studies and Bible college and seminary. I, I did. I learned a lot. But real spiritual growth and maturity come from spending time with Jesus and his word. Just getting alone with him. And they lived with Jesus. They slept with Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They listened to Jesus. They watched Jesus as he taught the word, as he touched the sick, as he, as he ministered to the poor and the outcasts, the lepers, the prostitutes, the religious, the, 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 the priests, the, 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 the hurting. And they would wake up in the morning and go, where's Jesus? Oh, he's, he, he's up early praying. I guess we should probably learn something from that. Yeah, and you can listen to Bible studies and podcasts. But it's another thing, listen, it's another thing as someone who's been called by Jesus is to spend time with Jesus and just get to know who he is. See, I, I grew up on the Gulf Coast here, dropped out of high school at 16. And one of the reasons I dropped out of high school at 16 because my brother was getting ready as a pro surfer to go on this tour from Miami to Maine representing a company called Greg Knoll Surfboards. And he said, hey, Greg said, you could go if you want to be a part of the team. Well, who wants to stay in high school if you can go from Miami to Maine promoting surfboards and getting paid to do it? Sign me up. So off I went. And you can, you can learn a lot traveling about surfing and watching people in the water. And, and I remember when I first started at 13 surfing that I used to just paddle out and watch guys for a while. Just sit on the beach and, and see how they did things. And you can learn a lot that way by just watching. See, sur surfing has stages to it. And, you know, the first stage is, is just learning how to paddle. I don't know if you've ever paddled on a surfboard. But one sure sign if someone doesn't know what they're doing is their legs are hanging way off the end. And then the board's up like this, and pretty soon a wave's going to hit it and smack them in the face. And you realize they're a total kook if they paddle that way. And you go, this guy knows nothing about surfing. This the second stage, once you learn how to paddle a surfboard, is catching a wave. If you, if you catch it too late, it's going to pitch you out, and you're going to do a thing called pearl. If you, if you, if you, you know, take off too early, I mean, it's going to do that. If you Try to catch it late, you're not going to catch it. There's a certain time when it's the best time just to dig the thing in and paddle, and then they're standing up. And then there's turning. I don't know if any of you grew up in the stage. Remember those cars? They had a stick shift in them. Remember those? And you would grind the gears as you were trying to learn the clutch and the gas and the brake. Well, surfing's like that. When you first start driving a stick shift, I had a little Volkswagen bug, and, and you first start, <coughs> and then pretty soon, oh, I got this down, and pretty soon you're not even thinking about it. You're just shifting the gears and, you know, pushing the clutch, the brake. You don't even think about what you're doing with your feet. Surfing's like that. Pretty soon after you learn to paddle, after you learn to catch away, it's all one thing. You catch it, you stand up, and you turn. It's all one. You know, it's like shifting gears. And you can watch people do it. You can get involved in doing it. And pretty soon, you don't even have to think about it. And, and I think as they watched Jesus and, and, and he showed them the people he loved and he taught them and, and, and they were disciples of this. They wanted to learn it. And, and, he, and, he, and he called them and, he, and he, then finally he sends them out there in, in, in Matthew chapter 10. You know, it says, and when he had called his disciples, and then he calls them apostles. And when you think of the disciples, when you think of the apostles, what do you think of? Guys with robes, big heavy beards, sandals, apostles. You know, they were just ordinary guys. Most of them were probably very young in their late teens or 20s when Jesus called them ordinary, not strong academic. 
no powerful big social standing, not amazingly gifted. They all had issues and flaws and at time totally lacked commitment and faith. I mean, Peter denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. At the end of his ministry, almost three and a half years he had been, and, and, and Jesus said, Peter, uh, before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. And Peter went, Lord, these other guys? Yeah, I can see them doing that. But this is Peter. Lord, I, I, I will never deny you. And then that fateful night, there he is around the campfire. Jesus is being tried. And three times he denied. And the cock crowed. Don't you think later, when the disciples would get together, because he pointed them out and said, these guys will deny, I never will. That from the back once in a while, one guy would go, I mean, I can see me doing that to Peter. Hey, Peter. Peter's like, yeah. They're just ordinary guys. Judas sold him out for 30 pieces of silver after hanging with him for all that time and seeing all the things he did. Later, he, he took the money and he threw it back. Kissed Jesus on the cheek in the garden, I mean, and, and made it look like he was being affectionate, but really he was just pointing out to the guards who Jesus was. I mean... Over and over again, you see the humanity of these. You know, the other ten deserted and ran for their lives there in the Garden of Gethsemane. There's hope for you and I. So, so Jesus brings these guys together. Matthew, a tax collector. In the group with uh, Simon the Zealot, who, who hated Romans and hated anybody who had anything to do with Rome. And now there's Matthew sitting with him. Two radically opposed mindsets. Peter outspoken and, 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 you know, very proud. And then you've got Thomas, who was kind of a shy, downer kind of person. At one time, they were going to go somewhere. And they, they said, well, they're going to, Lord, you shouldn't go there. They'll put you to death. And Thomas responded like this. He goes, let's go and die with Jesus. Then another time he said, I won't even believe he rose from the dead. This is, you know, very pessimistic uh, kind of guy Thomas was. He said, I'm not going to believe unless I literally stick my hand in his side and put my finger in the hand prints. But the only qualification for these guys to be part of this group, his people, was that Jesus chose them. He called them. And they answered the call. He, he, you know, he, he said, you know, behold, I'll stand at the door for you and me and knock. And, and he won't force himself on you, but he said, if you open the door, I'll come in. If you'll, if you'll leave your old life behind. And a lot of people think, well, not me. I, I couldn't do it. I've tried. It, I'll never be able to live up to the standard of, you know, following Jesus. Listen. If a family prayed and God brought Mary, the Basset Hound, home on a private jet with a steak dinner and a new Indianapolis Colts t-shirt, if he can do that for a Basset Hound, what can he do for you? He doesn't force you. He just calls you. He just says, will you come? I mean, 46 years ago, Lynn and I vowed to walk together as husband and wife till death do us part. And we've almost killed each other a couple times. But it's not just the, it's not, it wasn't just the vows that kept us together. It, it, it was the commitment we had to Christ before that. To live for him and to follow him. Off to Assembly of God Bible College and a Baptist seminary and sent back to my hometown with not the understanding to plant a church. We had no idea. But we said, okay, we'll do it for a year. And, and we transitioned to that role. But, but the greatest part of 
the 40 years has been going through the stages with Jesus. Now, I wouldn't say that, you know, pastoring a church for 40 years has been easy. There's been valleys and there's been mountaintops. A lot of valleys. I, I stood in this church and I did my own brother's funeral. Never thought I'd do that. Did my mom's funeral. Did my sister's funeral. Did my stepsister's funeral. And, and on and on I could tell you about the weddings and the funerals and the difficulties. I, I can walk through the, the, the graveyard down there in Gulf Breeze and gosh, so many memories come flooding back. 40, 40 years uh, of sharing life with people who, who love Jesus has been awesome. The highs, the lows. And telling others about the life you can have with Jesus and the, the change he brought in my life. I mean, in my wildest dreams as a young man growing up in a broken family and a stepdad and a, a mom who was a single mom for quite a while, I never in my wildest dreams would have thought I would be a pastor. I mean, it's just not, no way. I, I remember coming home from Bible college after my first year, and my mom owned a florist shop, and, and her and another lady were, were partners in it, and I would deliver flowers for her. I was very quiet, very shy at that time in my life. And I can remember my own mother as, as I was going through Bible college going, are you sure that's what you're supposed to do? I go, well, I think so. She goes, yeah, I, I just don't see you that way. <laughs> okay, Mom. But, but I stuck with it thinking, well, you know, I, I don't know. I just feel like this is what I'm supposed to do, where I'm supposed to be. And, and maybe today, you know, Jesus has been knocking on your heart. I, I know if you're a Christian, I, I know he's saying, you know, just don't remain a disciple. Constantly learning and learning and learning. But, but there's a harvest out there. There's people out there that, that the Lord wants you to not only rub shoulders with, but to share his great love for them. Uh, you might be here today and you say, uh, I've walked with the Lord, but I've kind of drifted far from him. I don't really spend time with the Lord. I spend more time watching football or soccer or whatever than I would ever with the Lord. You know, if, if you're not sure, let, let's say you died today. Would you go to heaven? Do you know that for sure? The Bible says these things are written that you might know. You can know. Or, or maybe you're here and, and you say, you know, I, I'm a prodigal. I'm one of those ones who in and out, I don't really have a consistent role with the Lord, but I want to. Well, you need to make sure, especially in the time and the place that we live today, you need to make sure. There, there's signs of the time, wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes. You know, there's been 12,000 earthquakes just in 2023. And there's certainly wars and rumors of wars. And, and there's certainly things going on right now with, with Russia and Iran and with China and, 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 and with, you know, uh, what's going on with Gaza, Hamas, Lebanon. And I think the Lord is shaking and he's revealing that you and I need to be ready and to, to open our eyes up and look and see that the harvest is right because here's the deal. People are weary and they're scattered and Jesus loves them and he loves you and he's not willing that any should perish. And, and today I, I, would, I would encourage you, I, I would on behalf of Jesus Christ invite you to say yes to him. Invite him into your heart or, or come back and recommit your life to him. We, we, we all need forgiveness. We all need a first chance, a second chance, and a third chance. And perhaps today the Lord's knocking, he's calling, he's tugging on your heart. And I would encourage you not to resist that, to not say no to him again.